hauled this notation out on Monday, but I'll remind you. This is the apples and oranges notation. I like this a lot. I don't know why I didn't <laughs> think about it 20 years ago. Here's how it... Here's how it played out in this particular assignment. I saw a couple of instances of things like this. In one of the problems, you're asked to find what? The order of the factor group or something like that. The order of the element of the factor group. So some of you said, well, if I take the coset 0, 2 plus h, with that notation, that you told me that that was in h. Mm. This is a coset. Yeah. So it makes sense to talk about this being in G slash H because it's a coset. It would make sense, although it wouldn't be stylistically good, to say that this is contained in H as a coset. But to say that it's in H is no good because now you're comparing cosets to elements of a subgroup. And that makes no sense. Okay, so the apples and oranges, that's not good. Similarly, some of you said something like the element 0, 2 is H. That's no good either. This is a set and that's a single element. So this is another apples and oranges issue. The way you want to phrase that is, if you're going to convince me what the order of an element is, if you wind up with an element that happens to be in the subgroup, therefore, 0, 2 bar is the identity. 0, 0 bar. If you have an element in the subgroup, then necessarily that element generates the same coset as any element in the subgroup. In particular, it generates the same coset as the identity element. In particular, it's the identity element of the coset group. Okay. All right, so that's the apples and oranges comment for this homework assignment. Um, in that modified second part of the question that I had you do from section three, showing that you get an isomorphism from the collection of non-zero complex numbers to the collection of non-zero elements inside H, this thing that we called H star, most all of you well, had written down the correct function, so that was good. But you wrote down the correct function in part, I forget the problem number, 33 or 30 or something. In part A, you wrote down, well, here's what the function should do. It should take a complex number, and there's a generic form of a complex number where A and B are real numbers, and should spit out this matrix. Okay, good. So there was your function. And then what you said in part B is, well, let's just look at the same function in part B. Okay, good idea. The issue, though, in part B is you then technically have to make sure that if you start with something not zero here, because that's the new input set, that you actually get something not zero here, because that's the new output set. So you have to make sure that in the original sort of uh, uh, connection between input complex number zero and output matrix zero, that when you throw out the zero in one of them and you throw out the zero in the other, that you've actually thrown out the two things that were compared to begin with. Okay? So technically, and some of you didn't do this, and I didn't nick you for it, but it's a good thing to observe. Note that if A plus BI is actually in C star, then this thing, A minus B, BA, is actually in H star. The point being, if this is in C star, it means neither A, it means both of A or B aren't zero. In other words, you can't have both A and B equaling zero. That's how you get the zero element in the complex numbers, which means if either one or both of these are not zero, then this matrix is also not zero. And conversely, it turns out when you show that this thing is onto, you have to convince me that if you take a non-zero matrix, it actually comes from a non-zero complex number, and that's pretty easy to do. So it's not that the task was hard, it's just technically you have to note that that's what's really going on here. And so what do you eventually do? You eventually show that this group is isomorphic to that group because you write down a homomorphism that's one-to-one -one and onto. And remember the philosophy of what it means for two groups to be isomorphic. It means, in a sense, they walk and talk the same way. They behave the same. So that means whatever sort of properties 
that you can write down about the complex numbers under multiplication, I'm sorry, the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication, also holds true for this collection of matrices, which means, in effect, if all you're interested in is multiplication of non-zero complex numbers, you can actually do it without worrying about the symbol i. You can actually do it just by looking at certain matrices. So it turns out you can describe multiplication in the complex numbers without cooking up a special symbol called i that has this magic property that when you square it, you get negative 1, or rephrase that when you take it to its fourth power that you get 1, but no lower power gets you to 1. I mean, that's a property of this thing, and you're a little bit uncomfortable with that the first time you see it, because you're thinking, well, I can't, I can't touch it, I can't hold it, where is it? The point is, well, if you don't like i, then just think of things as matrices, because that's what this isomorphism lets you do. So if you want a thing whose square is negative 1, or whose fourth power is 1, but no lower power is 1, I'll give you one. Instead of thinking of it as i, well, what does the specific non-zero complex number i correspond to under this isomorphism. It corresponds to, in particular, in particular, if you do phi of i, well, put it in the right form, it's phi of, it's phi of 0 plus 1 i, right, that's what i is, and what gets kicked out if you plug in a equals 0 and b equals 1, you get 0 minus 1, 1, 0. So the point is, whatever properties this has, vis-a-vis -vis its multiplication, this one has the same properties, because the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication is isomorphic to this collection of matrices under matrix multiplication. And yet, there's no i's here, folks. It's zeros and ones and minus ones. Okay, it's matrix multiplication now, but if you're more comfortable with that than this number i, then at least you're in good shape. And look, if I take this thing, let's call this, I don't know, z or something like that, then what's z squared? Well, intuitively, what you're figuring is it's whatever i squared is. Well, i squared is minus 1. So what you're expecting is z squared to be minus 1, but minus 1 meaning sort of minus 1 in the context of matrices. Let's see what we get. Multiply it out. Which is minus... 1, where 1 means multiplicative identity, at least in the system that you're working in, there it is. So what's z to the fourth? In other words, it's e or i or 1 or whatever you want to call it. It's the thing that behaves as the identity element in whatever system you're working in, which in the complex numbers we choose to call this, but well, it's really 1 plus 0i in the complex numbers. Hey, if you want to treat it instead as matrices, just view them as 2 by 2 matrices. So what this notion of isomorphism allows you to do sometimes is just sort of change your point of view. You don't like cooking up a new symbol to work with? That's fine. Just review things as happening inside a different sort of system that maybe you understand a little bit better that you're a little bit more comfortable with. Okay. Question. Yeah. Can't you have an isomorphism on something that's not a group? In other words, why don't you take the zeros out? Yeah, good question. Uh, you can talk about isomorphisms between sets having binary operations. You can do that. But I'm not so interested in that. I'm interested in having binary operations that form groups and then isomorphisms of groups. That's why, yeah, I mean, as far as the order goes, folks, I would have loved to have seen chapter 3 as chapter 16. But he, he, <laughs> but he chooses to talk about the notion of isomorphism at a level sort of one step before we even get to groups. He talks about isomorphisms between sets. And that's perfectly mathematically legit to do. It's just at the time that we're dealing with just sets with binary operations, you don't have a good enough feel, I don't think, for what the structure of those things are. And if we're going to talk about things being isomorphic, having the same structure, to me it makes more sense to talk about things that actually have a richer structure to begin with, groups, and then talk about isomorphism in that context. So, so you're right. I mean, uh, Richard's question is, would you get an isomorphism if you 
remove the stars here? And the answer is yes, it's just the underlying sets that aren't groups anymore. They're just, I don't know, they're binary operations on sets. But so, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So as I said, if I, if I were to write, I would not n ever write an algebra book. But <laughs> I mean, it's just, I have some colleagues that have written textbooks, and it's just, it's an incredible energy drain. And, you know, in the end, if you feel like you've got some big contribution to make, then maybe it, there's some merit to doing it. But I think the only contribution I'd be able to make is if I could take, if, if you know, Professor Fraley would allow me to take his book and just move things around a little bit, then I'd be happy doing that. But not sitting down and cranking up one from scratch. Lonnie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Lonnie's question is sort of where did the eye go and how did it sort of get, how did it manifest itself over here? Well, I mean, I counted out a table using, you know, sort of just one, a ones matrix, the minus one setup, which I could claim was, you know, the representation of a matrix, you know, on the real numbers, just because I could manipulate the group table around and get a thing that looked just like the matrix that you have there. I know I was way off base, so I didn't know what the philosophy was. Just set that up that way and then just prove the claims that it is. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the issue with the group table is I mean, there's infinitely many things in here that you've got to worry about, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so trying to pound out a group table isn't going to get you there here, but, but I, I think the, the better question is, so, all right, you know, I have this thing called I, and I'm trying to make it look like a matrix. And that's what's going on here. You're taking a complex number and you're associating with a matrix. And how do you do that in such a way that somehow preserves the structure of multiplication in the complex numbers? But I thought it was under addition. Well, in part A it was addition. Right. And then part... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, in part A. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I totally missed the question then. So in part A, yeah, when you're asked to set up this Correspondence under addition. So I'm sorry, ask the question again then, Lonnie. Well, so I mean, that's really what I was struggling with under addition, how do I get from the you know, left hand side to the right? You know, and like you said, retain the property that, that yeah. exists somehow and the isomorphism is the real number somehow. Uh-huh. You know, let me see if I can answer it this way. As far as the addition goes, when you're adding complex numbers, you don't care what the heck that symbol is. It could be an X. Because if you're adding complex numbers, you never use the multiplicative property of this thing, which is really what makes it different from the real numbers. Right? So this can be any symbol you want it to be. And what we're saying is, if you have this sort of extra symbol, you can sort of lay it into the matrices any way you want. All you need is something that distinguishes the thing that sits out here by itself from the thing that's acting as the coefficient on this other term. So if you wanted to call this a plus b times x, or a plus b times y, I don't really care what that would be. All I'm really asking you to do is pick off A and B. Now, if the question is, well, couldn't you just correspond those to a pair, A comma B? Yeah, that would have been a good idea, too. But it turns out, because we're eventually interested in also asking about the multiplication structure, that we write down the function on the additive level that looks like this sort of very odd cross piece. So if I understand your question correctly, if this was only to be a question with part 33 and no 33b, then we'd just say, well, here's a function from the complexes to maybe r cross r, to two copies of the reals. Send phi of a plus b i just to a comma b. Is that a homomorphism? Yeah, it turns out to be isomorph. In fact, you know, that's a great question. So at the, at the additive stage, when you're doing problem 33a, what we've shown is that the group of complex numbers under addition is isomorphic to this funny looking group. But it's also isomorphic to just send phi of a plus b i to a comma b, which is just r cross r, in other words, r2. And you have, you have lots of ways of viewing r2. Typically, you view it as the plane, right? So that's the way you usually think of the complex numbers is you draw it like this, right? And there's r cross r. 
It's just here, there's another way to look at it. R cross R with sort of a little twist to it. Okay. All right. Let's see, am I done with the comments, the horn comments? I think so. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. Uh, oh, if you didn't get the email, I sent out an email yesterday. Uh, there will be an SI session on Monday before the exam. Jen will be able to be in Monday from 9 to 10.30 in the usual room, Engineering 177. Uh, she'll trade Wednesday for Monday, so there won't be an SI session on Wednesday, but there will be one on Monday, and then I'll be in before class if you've got sort of last-minute questions before the exam. All right. So here is what we're up to. We are looking at these things called rings, and we're sort of two lectures into rings already. In a lot of senses, we're going back to square one and we're thinking of these as new systems. But in other senses, the things that we're looking at, we've in some, to some degree already studied. For example, even in the definition of a ring, a ring is, well, I could list it out as something that has like nine properties to it. But a lot of those properties I can smash into one piece. It's a set with two binary operations, addition and multiplication, where when you view the set with the binary operation called plus, you get an abelian group. So it's huge, and it's stuff that we've done, you know, up until now in this course. So I don't have to worry about writing out e, what each and every, you know, detail of abelian group means. And then R with dot is simply a, an associative binary operation, and the addition uh, and multiplication are related by some sort of distributive law. And we have, up until now, written down a whole slew of different rings. Let me just remind you of some of those. The ring of integers, the ring of rational numbers, the ring of real numbers, the ring of complex numbers. The ring of n by n matrices, and what I'm putting inside the brackets here, folks, isn't just the real numbers, but take any ring you want. You can talk about the collection of n by n matrices where the entries come from that ring, and then it makes sense to do addition and matrix multiplication as usual, and you wind up with another ring. We can talk about, start with any ring and look at the collection of polynomials with coefficients in that ring. We can talk about these mod n arithmetic rings, and there are a slew of others that we well, might mention between now and the end of the semester, but these will be sort of the major players. These will be the rings that we're going to look at in most detail. Looking ahead a little bit, what we'll wind up doing with rings is quite similar to what we did with groups. We developed a whole set of examples of groups, and then we built new groups from the ones that we had already discovered or constructed by various operations. One was to look inside the given group to find subgroups. Well, similarly, we'll do that here. We've already seen situations where we've done it. For instance, we've looked inside the ring of real numbers to write down this ring that we called script S, things that look like rational plus a rational times the square root of 5 or something like that. There's a subring. We'll talk later on about direct products of rings. In fact, later on, it'll be in about 10 minutes. We'll eventually talk about factor rings just like we talked about factor groups, where you take an appropriate subring that has some sort of additional property that allows you to somehow get a well-defined operation on the cosets, and you wind up getting a factor ring. So a lot of the things that we'll study here won't be identical to what we've done in the past, but we'll have enough similarity that we won't have to reinvent the wheel when we look at those ideas again. Okay, and that'll be good. All right, here is what we did on Monday. Let me just remind you some of the words. This is a slightly unfortunate portion of the course because I have to throw a lot of words at you, so let me at least keep repeating them so that they start to sink in a little bit. Here were the words skew field, which was the same as division ring. They're used sort of equally in the literature. These are the same thing. This is a ring where if you look at the non-zero elements 
of the ring under multiplication is a group. That's what it means for the ring to be a skew field. For the ring to be a field without the word skew in front of it means that when you look at the ring, throw out the zero element and ask what sort of behavior is there under multiplication is an abelian group. That's what field means, skew field. And then this last term that we talked about at the end of Monday is what's called integral domain. An integral domain means the ring is uh, with unity. In other words, has a multiplicative identity, is commutative, yeah. and when you look at the non-zero elements and look at that as a set, it turns out that the binary operation really is one. In other words, a multiplication is a binary operation on the set is closed, i.e., get a binary operation. Another way to phrase this is an integral domain is a ring that has a unity element, has a one. Yeah, all these rings that we're going to look at this semester have a one. So this will typically be a non-issue. Our commutative, most of the rings that we'll look at this semester will be commutative, but certainly not all. If I look at matrices, Matrix, matrix multiplication is not commutative, but for the most part, the rings that we'll wind up focusing on have this property. And what this says is, if you're in, in, in an integral domain, that if you throw out the zero element, and then you multiply any of those two non-zero elements, that you again get a non-zero element. That's what integral domain means. We can point to some integral domains. That's an integral domain. Sometimes that's an integral domain. In fact. We proved a result last time that says exactly when it is. This is integral domain. That is 2 and that is 2. So let's see. This is integral domain. Domain. Yeah, if you take any two non-zero integers and you multiply them together, you get something non-zero. That's no big deal. This is also and this is also and this is also. Well, we proved last time that any field is an integral domain. So just a reminder integral domain. That's easy to see if the non-zero elements under multiplication form an abelian group. Well, if it's an abelian group, it has an identity element. If it's abelian, the multiplication is commutative. That's just another word that we use. And if it forms an abelian group, then it certainly has to be a binary operation. It has to be closed. So that's sort of a no-brainer for free. We get that fields imply integral domains. But the good thing to keep in mind is that there are many integral domains which are not fields, like the integers. Another good example of an integral domain that's not a field is this. If I start with, now I have to be a little bit careful here, I'm going to ask you to look at the collection of polynomials, but now I'm going to specify what coefficients I want you to use. I'm going to ask you to use real number coefficients. So these are the usual polynomials that you confront in a calculus one course, right? So polynomials where the coefficients are real numbers. This thing is an integral domain. And we gave a sort of informal proof on Monday. We're going to revisit these polynomial rings later on in more detail. But for now, the proof that R bracket X is an integral domain, again, R standing for the real numbers here, was if you take two non-zero things, two non-zero polynomials, and you multiply them together, can you get zero? Well, no. And the reason, essentially, is because tell me what the degree of the first polynomial is, you know, the highest power x term, and tell me what the highest power x term of the other polynomial is. Then when you do the product of the polynomials, you get a term that looks like x to the you know, m plus n, where the degrees are m and n, respectively. So it turns out you can't get zero because you always get the degree going up. There's a little bit more to it, but at least for now, this will be a good example of an integral domain that's not a field. And z is an integral domain, and neither of these are fields. These will be good examples to keep in mind. Okay. 
but not fields. Okay. There's a couple of goals for this evening, a couple of goals, two larger goals, bigger goals. The rest of the goals for tonight are just to introduce some additional notation and constructions that we'll need later on. Uh, the first is to show um, that every finite integral domain, domain is a field. That'll be interesting. So what that'll do is, in particular, what we'll show is the result will be proposition Z sub N is a field if and only if N is prime. So that's eventually where we're going to get tonight. And then the second goal, I don't want to phrase it here, oh yeah, is to look at zero divisors in here, yeah. yeah. Yeah, is to look at, um, look more carefully, carefully at R bracket X, where R here now doesn't have the extra line where I'm allowing uh, a general or any ring that you'd like to appear as the collection of coefficients. And along the way, we'll introduce some additional terminology, which I'm trying to parse out in little chunks so that I don't just snow you with a bunch of new words at the same time. Okay. Let's go ahead and do this first result. What's interesting, folks, is what I've written down as the two major examples of integral domains that are not fields. It's important for you to note that, well, there's obviously infinitely many integers. There's certainly infinitely many polynomials. In fact, that's true regardless of what ring you start with. I can always generate infinitely many different polynomials. Let me list out a few for you. X, that's a polynomial. So is X squared. And X cubed is a polynomial. And X to the fourth. So here's infinitely many. So this is always, and it turns out that in order to be able to write down examples of integral domains that are not fields, I have to be writing down infinite rings. Because what we're about to show is, if you hand me a ring that only has finitely many elements, here's a good example to keep in mind, that if that ring happens to be an integral domain, then it necessarily is going to be a field. And that's what we're about to prove here. So, it turns out, proposition, uh, suppose capital R is an integral domain with the added property and suppose suppose that the number of elements in R is finite. And I'll put in parentheses example, think Zn is a good example. An example when n is prime, because remember on Monday what we proved is if n is prime, then z sub n is an integral domain, and we proved also at the end of money that if, uh, n is in, if z n is an integral domain, then n is prime. In other words, that these two statements are if and only if. Then the conclusion is then necessarily R is a field. Hmm. Now the intuition I want you to somehow start developing as to what the difference is between an integral domain <clears throat> and a field is this. Think in an integral domain, you have lots of pieces. You at least can get off the ground in asking whether or not the non-zero elements of the ring under multiplication form a group. It makes sense to ask that question if you're an integral domain because at least you've got a binary operation. What else do you have? Well, you're assuming in an integral domain that the multiplication has an identity element. That's what it means to be with unity. So you've got a multiplication. By definition of a ring, the multiplication is associative. You've got an identity element. You've got abelianness. So in effect, folks, you get everything you need 
to show that the non-zero elements form an abelian group except what? Inverses. And the point is here, there are some elements that don't have multiplicative inverses. And the point is that here, some elements don't have multiplicative inverses. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the goal, really, in any situation where you're trying to convince me that an integral domain is a field, really the only thing you have to prove is that each non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So the proof is we, because R is an integral domain by hypothesis, is an integral domain, domain, in order to show it's a field, to show R is a field, all we need to do need is to show that for each non-zero element of R, for each, let's call it little a in the non-zero elements of R, and that's what the notation is R star, there exists an inverse. And let's write out what that means. There exists a B in R star with the property that when you multiply the two together, hmm. So what the heck is that thing? Well, that thing is the supposed unity that comes with the definition of an integral domain. You want to call it E? That's all right. But usually we call it 1 in the context of rings because that's what form it usually takes on. As we mentioned on Monday, it might look like the identity matrix. That's all right. Or it might look like the identity polynomial, just one. But that's a reasonable notation to use for this thing. Uh, let's see. Wait a minute. Uh, in order to show that inverses exist, remember in the definition of a group, inverse means that when you multiply the two or combine the two in the one order, you get the identity, but then you're also required to show that if you combine them in the other order that you get the identity as well. But that comes for free too because we're assuming that the ring we're starting with is commutative. In other words, we're already assuming that A, B equals B, A, regardless of which elements that you start with. So if you're going to get AB as 1, then I'll put in parentheses, this implies BA equals 1 automatically by commutativity. So we don't have to worry about that second piece of what it means to be an inverse element. Okay, somewhere along the line we need to use the fact that the ring is finite, and we do that right off the bat, here's how. So let's list the elements of R. Well, in fact, here's what I prefer to do. Throw zero out and just show me what R star looks like. Well, there's some elements in there. If the original ring is finite, if it's got M elements in it, then I'll tell you how many elements R star has, M minus one. You're just throwing one of the elements out. I don't care. The point is, though, that R star then is also a finite set. You're just throwing an element away from R. So list them out. How about, hmm. A1, A2, up through, let's call this maybe A sub M. There it is. Where M is the number of elements in the ring, minus 1, but I don't care what M is. Just that there's a finite number of things in here. If you want a specific example to drag along to keep in mind as we're doing this, think maybe R is, I don't know, Z7 or something like that. Because remember we showed on Monday that if you look at z sub a prime number, that you necessarily get an integral domain. In which case, what I'm doing is I'm writing out the elements of R star. And I'm not claiming that every finite integral domain looks like a z sub n, but at least we have some examples of finite integral domains, and let's see if we can figure out what's going on. All right, so now here's what I need you to do. Pick any non-zero element. A, okay, it's one of the things on this list, but it turns out I don't really care. It's one of the A sub I's, but that's going to turn out to not be an issue. What's the task? We've picked something in there. We need to somehow cook up or show that there exists an inverse for it. Hmm. So here's what I want you to do. Form this list. This list. What I want you to do is take this element A and simply multiply it in order times everything in R star. A, A1, 
AA2 up through AAM. That was easy to do. Now, here's two important properties of this list. First of all, I'm in an integral domain. That means by definition, if I take two non-zero elements and I multiply them, I get something not zero. Well, look, each of these things is in R star. The thing that I've picked is in R star. So each of these products is a non-zero element times a non-zero element. So by definition of an integral domain, necessarily each of these things is non-zero. So the point is that this set lives inside not just the ring, that's a no-brainer, but lives inside the non-zero elements of the ring, since R is an integral domain. We're using the fact that the product of any two non-zero elements is necessarily non-zero to claim that everything here winds up back in the collection of non-zero elements. That's the first observation. Here's the second observation. We're going to use a result that we proved on Monday that says this. But, let's see, on Monday we proved that if you're in an integral domain, if AAI equals AAJ, if we have three elements in an integral domain and they're all non-zero, that's exactly what we've got here. A is non-zero and each of the A sub I's on the list is non-zero. Then you can cancel the A. So just recall, proposition, in an integral domain, as long as you've taken three non-zero, uh, as long as you've taken three non-zero elements, A, A, I, and A, J, I think I called them A, B, and C on Monday, but the notation is a non-issue. If A times one is the same A times another, then the two things are equal to begin with. So here's what that means, folks. It means if you're looking through the elements of this list, there's no repeats. The reason there's no repeats is because you've originally listed out the set R star in such a way that there's no repeats. Multiplying by this particular element A means there's no repeats. So conclude that there's no repeats on the list. There are no repeated elements. Elements in the list. Again, if there were repeated elements, repeated elements would mean that you've got one of these things equal to another of them, but that can't happen because if the two things were equal, then they actually started off as the same element in R star to begin with. So here now is the setup. I've got a subset of R star. How many different elements are on this list? Answer the same number as there were different elements on the original list. So it means that the number of elements in this set is M. And you go, so what? So you've written down a subset of a set. But now I've convinced you that the subset that I'm interested in actually has exactly the same number of elements as the original set. And folks, if you have a finite set and you have a subset, something inside it, but the subset contains the same number of elements as the whole set, then the subset is the whole set. So the conclusion is that the subset is our star. It's usually called the pigeonhole principle or something like that. If I hand you a set with 10 elements and I tell you I have a subset with 10 elements, there's only one choice. The subset is the set. That's all we're using here. Quick remark. It's exactly at this point that the proof would fail if we didn't assume the set was finite. Because at this point, all we'd be able to conclude is something like, now I have an infinite subset of an infinite set. Can I conclude that the subset equals the set? No way. I mean, think if I had listed inside the non-zero integers and simply asked you to pick the number 4 and asked you to multiply each of the integers by 4, I'd get a perfectly good subset of the non-zero integers. I'd get the non-zero multiples of 4, which certainly doesn't equal all the possible integers. But when we've got a finite set, a finite subset, no, let me rephrase that, a subset of a finite set that contains the same number of elements as the set is the set. And that's what we're about to use here. So what? So, in particular, 
What in particular? Well, let's see. The identity element is in our star. Yeah, because by hypothesis, I'm in an integral domain, so there is a unity element. So one of the elements on this list is the identity. I don't really care where it is. Heck, you could have listed it out first if you wanted, but it doesn't really matter. So let's see. One of the a sub i's, let's call it, of the a sub I don't know, k's is 1. Just without loss of generality, let's say a sub 1 is 1. Again, I kind of rigged the list that way to begin with, but it doesn't really matter where it is. So what does that mean? So, hmm, 1 is in here, 1 is in here, but if it's in here and this set equals this set, that means 1 is in here. Okay, so what are the things in that subset look like? So 1 is in our star which is AA1, AA2, up through AAM. So the conclusion is, so 1 equals AAT for some T. In other words, if 1 is in this set. All right, so where is it? I don't care. Maybe it's there, maybe it's there, maybe it's there. Wherever it is, it means that 1 has to look like that. So we're done. So done. A sub T equals B works. I've convinced you that there is some element inside the ring with the property that when you multiply it by E, you get one. Okay, we have to do it in the other order too? No, because we're assuming that the ring is commutative. Have I actually produced the element that works for you? No. So this is what we usually call an existence proof. I've convinced you by properties of finite sets that there necessarily has to be an element that works. But I haven't given you any sort of algorithm or formula as to how to produce it. For example, what would happen over here? If I wanted to find something like the inverse of 4 in Z7, then what I would ask you to do if A is 4, then I'd ask you to multiply each of these elements through by the number 4, and let's see what we'd get. We'd get 4 times 1, 4 times 2, 4 times 3, that's 12, but in Z7 that's 5. 4 times 4 is 16, which in Z7 is 2. 4 times 5 is 20, which in Z7 is 6. 4 times 6 is 24, which in Z7 is 3. So in the particular case where I happen to start with Z7, if I start with A equals 4, here is the list. Does 1 appear in there? Yeah, there it is. Do I happen to know where it appears? No. If I start with a different one, maybe I start with A equals, I don't know, 3 or something like that. Here's what the list looks like if you start with A equals 3. 3 times 1, 3 times 2, 3 times 3 is 9, but in Z7 that's 2. 3 times 4 is 12, which is 5. 3 times 5 is 15, which in Z7 is 1. 3 times 6 is 18, which is, so there's the list. Where does the 1 appear? I don't know, could appear anywhere. But the point is, folks, when you list things out, if you're starting inside an integral domain, if you list things out, you're necessarily going to see distinct or different entries in this list when you do the products. And since you're looking at different entries, all of which are non-zero, necessarily this list is the original list. So somewhere along the line, you had to find the number one in there. It's not too bad. So if somebody says, give me an example of an integral domain that's not a field, these are the two good places to look. But it's key that you understand that you can't look at a finite ring. You can't look at, for example, any of these ZN rings to try to find such an example because we've just shown that any finite integral domain is a field. So here is a corollary to a result that we proved on Monday. Therefore, uh, these statements are equivalent. First, n is prime. Secondly, z sub n is an integral domain. Domain. And third, uh, z sub n is a field. Last year I uh, no, it was two years ago. What I've seen happen to students is this. 
you look at this list of equivalent statements about z sub n rings and you try to generalize it to all rings. You're now looking at a result that says the ring is an integral domain precisely when it's a field. And what students somehow do is they take that as some sort of ticket to a place that you don't want to be and the ticket is, oh, then any integral domain is a field. Uh -uh. It's only these kinds of integral domains that happen to be fields. There's many that aren't. All right. Hmm. Questions? Question. So your, your first list, R star, mm -hmm. it's finite, mm -hmm. but it's exhaustive, I guess. It, whatever group you're using or field you're using there. Yeah, it's exhaustive of whatever whatever integral domain I've asked you to start with. And, and that's by definition of integral domain? That's by definition of the number of elements in the set assuming to be assumed to be finite. It means that if there's a finite number of things in the ring, maybe there's six things in the ring or seven things in the ring, like in this particular situation, there's seven things in the ring, then what I ask you to do is throw out zero. That means that there's going to be six things left over. Now just list those six things out. So it's all the elements in the set. Yeah. That, so, yeah, there's, there, maybe I should have played up this equal sign more. Here, by definition, can be assumed to be all of the non-zero elements of R, list amount. So the equal sign here is sort of emphatic. Here they are, and here's all of them. And the point is, I can exhaust them all because I've assumed that the set is finite. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there's a number of you in this class that were in the number theory course last spring or in Dr. San's number theory course two springs ago. What I want to do is spend uh, five minutes on a little detour and show you that what turns out to be a nice and maybe somewhat surprising result from the number theory course pops out almost immediately as a corollary to the stuff that we just proved and Lagrange's theorem. So here is an aside. Turns out, here's a result from the number theory course, Math 311. This is usually referred to as Fermat's little theorem. Little theorem. It's a pretty nice result. It says the following, let P be a prime, let P be prime, let A be any integer, uh, and suppose P doesn't divide A. In other words, take any integer that's not a multiple of the prime number that you started with. So if you start with the number 5, take anything that's not a multiple of 5. Then here's the punchline. Then if you take that integer, then a raised to the p minus 1 power, some of you remember this result, is congruent to what? 1 mod p. For those of you that aren't familiar with this number theory notation, this means if you take this thing, you raise it to the p minus 1 power, and then you divide it by p using long division, that the remainder will always be 1. So, for example, if you take 783, which is not divisible by 5, and you raise it to the 5 minus 1, you raise it to the fourth power, the remainder is going to be 1 mod 5. Hmm. Fermat spent a lot of time proving this thing. In fact, he gave a number of different proofs. And it turns out we'll be able to prove it extremely quickly. Proof. Hmm. Well, what we're saying is, the result rephrased is, result rephrased is that, is that if you take this element and this element, that those two things are equal in the ring ZP. Because that's what it means to say two things are congruent mod p. It means that if you consider them as elements in the set, 
0 through p minus 1 where the arithmetic is done mod p, but you've got the same two things. All right, so I need to somehow convince you that if I take a to the p minus 1, that I get 1 mod p, but wait a minute. But here's what we've just shown. p is prime, so what does that mean? It means that z sub p is a field, a field, previous result, that's what we just proved. Which means, by definition, if you look at the non-zero elements under multiplication, that this is an abelian group. In particular, it's a group. I won't actually need that it's abelian, but it turns out we get that for free. Hmm. That's what it means for a ring to be a field. It means if you throw out the zero element, that you get a group. Well, look, folks. I've asked you to take an integer that p doesn't divide. In other words, that isn't a multiple of p. Rephrased in terms of z sub p language, this simply means that I've asked you to take an integer that's not 0 in z sub p. That's not a multiple of p. So the hypothesis is p doesn't divide a simply means that a, when you view it mod p, is non-zero. Think mod 5, if I hand you the number 10, well, that's 0 mod 5. Or if I hand you the number 100, that's 0 mod 5. And I'm asking you not to do that. Take something else. Take 98. That's not 0 mod 5. Mm -hmm. Being not 0 means it's in the star. That's just the notation. OK, now we did our homework assignment. And that homework problem was use Lagrange's theorem to show that if you're in a finite group, and you tell me how many elements are in the group. The notation that was used in the problem was n. If there's n elements in the group, and you take any element of the group, and you raise it to the nth power, that you get the identity of the group. I'm sorry, I can't pull out the exact place where that was. I think it was section 9 or section 8 or something like that. Show that in a finite group G, if the number of elements in the group is n, and you take any element in the group and you raise it to the nth power that you get the identity. So now use an old homework problem. Old homework problem. And I'll put in parentheses which was done based on Lagrange's theorem. On Lagrange's theorem. And what you get to conclude is that if you have an element in a group, I do. I have A, which is in this group and you raise it to the number of elements in the group, well, folks, if I take zp and I've thrown out 0, then I've got p minus 1 elements left. That I get the identity element in this group. And we're done. That's exactly what Fermat's theorem says. I like this. So there is Fermat's little theorem done from the point of view of taking ZP, realizing that when you throw zero out, not only do you get a binary operation under multiplication, you actually get a group, and then hauling out Lagrange's theorem. Lagrange's theorem simply says if you take, well, one manifestation of Lagrange's theorem is that if you're in a finite group and you raise any element in the group to the order of the group power that you get the identity element in the group. And this is just recasting that more general group result in the specific context of the ZP rings. Okay. All right. Questions? Comments? There is what's called Euler's generalization of Fermat's little theorem. And it turns out we'll be able to get that result as well, but we've got to work a little bit harder first. So we'll just sort of be I don't know, satisfied that we're able to reprove Fermat's little theorem using some groups here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Question, Lonnie. Careful, under multiplication, so the identity is, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right. 
So, yeah, I gotta throw some words at you here, and here they are. So, some words. Words. Uh, there are these. Uh, first is a unit in a ring with unity. This is why I hate this notation. Unity, folks, is what every other algebraist on the planet calls an identity element, or a one in a ring. So a ring with one, and we all know what one means. A ring that has an element that behaves like the multiplicative identity is uh, an element, we'll call it little a, for which there exists. There exists an element B having A, B equals 1, and B, A equals 1. So a unit. Well, the word unit is actually relatively standard notation. Other people call these invertible elements. An invertible element in a ring is an element that has a multiplicative inverse. It's a, an element that you can somehow find an inverse to, where inverse means under the multiplication. And you're thinking, well, how would I know that when you talk about the inverse of an element that you're talking about multiplication? The answer is, folks, because remember, the addition operation inside a ring is always viewed as being as nice as you'd want it to be. There's always inverse elements under the addition. So asking whether or not there's an inverse element for an element ring always is a question about the multiplicative structure. A, a quick side note, if you happen to be in a commutative ring with unity, a commutative ring with identity, if you have this property, then obviously that one follows for free. There are situations where you have that property and you actually don't have this property. In those situations, we might call B something like a right inverse for A. Or if you have this property, but not that one, you might call B a left inverse for A. So sometimes we talk about two-sided inverses or simply one-sided inverses if that happens or if that happens. But our focus will be typically on commutative rings. And so inside a commutative ring, being a two-sided unit, in other words, both of these equations holding, is the same as being a one-sided unit. You simply have to find an element that works here. That's a unit. And the second word, I, I put these two in the same list, but in some sense they represent opposite ends of the spectrum as far as multiplication goes. The second phrase is... I mean, it'll sound sort of odd because you've been trained over the many years to think that you can't do this. A zero divisor. In a ring R uh, is an element, is a non-zero element, non-zero element with the property that element, let's call it A, element A in the ring for which there exists, this pen's running out, for which there exists a non-zero element B in the ring having a times B equal to zero. So a zero divisor means you've got an element in a ring that's not zero, and you can pair it up with something else that's not zero, but when you multiply them together, you get zero. Thinking, I don't know anything like that. Well, you do know some things like that. You've seen some things like that. There aren't any in the integers or in the rationals or the reals or the complexes, but there's lots of things like that, and we looked at some on Monday uh, inside the two by two matrices. It's easy to find things, neither of which are zero individually, that give zero. 
It's also easy to find examples of zero divisors in z sub n rings where n isn't prime. For instance, in z sub 6, 2 isn't 0 and 3 isn't 0, but 2 times 3 is 6, which is 0 in z sub 6. So there's lots of different situations where we have these. It turns out you can redefine what it means for a ring to be an integral domain. Integral domain means it's a ring with unity and is commutative. And instead of saying that the collection of non-zero elements is closed under multiplication, all you need to do is say that there are no zero divisors. In other words, that it's impossible to find two non-zero elements that multiply to zero. So it's simply another formulation or another way to look at what the notion of an integral domain is. And the proposition is that somehow these two ideas live at the end of the multiplicative spectrum in general, although in many situations there's lots of stuff in between. So it turns out if you're a zero divisor, then you can't be a unit. So the zero divisors are sort of here, bless you. The units are here. In some situations, that's everything. But in some situations, there's lots of stuff that neither falls into this camp nor into this camp. But it's always the case that if you're here, you can't be here. And if you're here, you can't be here. Other stuff, maybe. Sometimes. Here's an example. If I give you a field, for instance, if I give you the, mm, let's start with the rational numbers. If I give you the rational numbers, that's a field. And I ask you to find the units. Well, let's see, the units are those things that have multiplicative inverses, which is everything except for zero. So in that particular case, the units are everything, and there's actually no zero divisors. It's impossible inside the rationals to have two non-zero things that multiply to zero. So in that particular case, the units take up everything and the, there, there's no zero divisors. The zero itself is always viewed as exceptional. In other situations, there's lots of zero divisors. Like in z sub 6, there are many zero divisors. Like 2 is a zero divisor because 2 times 3 is zero. And 3 is a zero divisor because 3 times 2 is zero. And 4 is a zero divisor because 4 times 3 is zero in z sub 6. So in a ring like Z6, the zero divisors actually play a big role. How about inside the integers? Well, see, inside the integers, there's no zero divisors. There's no non-zero elements that you can multiply together to give zero, so there's none of those. The units, there's not very many units inside the integers either. Units are those things that have multiplicative inverses. Well, one has a multiplicative inverse itself. Minus 1 has a multiplicative inverse itself, and that's it. Nothing else has a multiplicative inverse. So in the integers, these two sets, that one's empty, and this one's really small. So the way things break out element-wise, at least these are at the two ends of the spectrum, and sometimes there's stuff in between. Let's prove that these can't overlap. So the proposition is uh, the collection of zero divisors, zero divisors, intersect the set of units is always empty in any ring. In any ring. That means empty set in any ring. And the proof is, let's see. So I first have to show you that if I take a unit, it's not a zero divisor. And then if I take a zero divisor, it's not a unit. So first let Let's call it U. Let U be a unit in the set of units. So what does that mean? So there exists, there is something called B in R so that when you do the product, U times B is 1, and that's the same as B times U. That's the hypothesis. I want to show it's not a zero divisor. Show that U is not a zero divisor. We'll do it by contradiction. Suppose u is a zero divisor. Suppose it is. 
u is a zero divisor. So what does that mean? So it means that if I, so there exists, there is, let's call it z in R, where with hmm, u z equals zero and z not equal to zero. That's what it means to be a zero divisor. <clears throat> Definition of a zero divisor is you're not zero and you can find something else that's not zero so that when you multiply the two things together you get zero. And what we're about to contradict is z not equaling zero. Well, let's see. If I have u times z is zero, what I'm going to do is choose to multiply both sides of that equation on the left by b. So b times u times z is b times zero. If I have two things that are equal in a ring, then I can multiply both sides as long as I keep the sides straight. So I'm going to choose to multiply on the left by b. Oh, but wait a minute, we proved on the first day that we started discussing rings that in any ring, if you multiply zero, you get zero. So here's what we get. B times U, oh, but wait a minute, the multiplication in a ring is associative. I'm not commuting anything here, folks, I'm just regrouping. So B times U times Z is zero. But wait a minute, B times U is one. But one times anything is that thing. So I've started with something not zero, and I've led to the contradiction that it is zero, so there's the contradiction. So the conclusion is that u is not a zero divisor, because by assuming it was a zero divisor, I was led to the contradiction that z is both zero and not zero. Hmm. So what we've shown is that if you're in here, you can't be in here, and the converse will be just as quick, and then we'll call it a night here. Conversely, Converse, converse is, suppose I take something that's a zero divisor, let's call it z is a zero divisor, show that z is not a unit. So what does it mean by hypothesis to say that z is a zero divisor? So by hypothesis, z is not zero, and there exists, there is, well, let's call it w not equal to zero, so that z w is zero. That's what it means to be a zero divisor, that you're not zero and you can combine with something else not zero to give zero. And what I want to do is show that z is not a unit. And we'll do it as well by contradiction. By contradiction, by contradiction, assume z is a unit. And we'll see what sort of contradiction we get to. In other words, i.e., assume that we can find there is a b so that when you combine it with z, z times b is 1 in either order. Because as I mentioned, we're going to assume the unit means two-sided unit, that you can get it both ways. And we'll see what sort of contradiction we can get to, but let's see. So I have z times w is 0, but I've assumed that w is not 0. So I have z, w is 0, that's the hypothesis, but I'm going to play the same game that I just played. Now multiply both sides on the left by b. Mm -hmm. But now I can regroup these. b times 0, 0, but b times z was 1. 1 times w is w, and so we get w is 0, which contradicts w being not 0. Contradiction. So the conclusion is that z is in fact not a unit. 
And the conclusion then is that the proposition holds. Namely, if you start with a unit, it's not a zero divisor. And if you start with a zero divisor, it's not a unit. All right. Questions there? Comments? All right. This is a good place to quit then. Of course, there's no new homework assignment. And the assignment that I gave you last Monday was already due the previous Monday so that you could have it back in hand for the exam. Uh, if anybody wandered in late and needs graded homework return, I've got that here. I've also got exam.